Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. This time we're looking at an Amiga 4000 motherboard. This belongs to Ravi Abbott. Uh, you'll know him from the Retro Hour podcast. Uh, it's a really good uh, podcast. I'll put a link down below. You should listen to that. They've uh, interviewed lots of uh, famous people related to the retro gaming and um, computing industry. And he works alongside Dan Wood. Those two are the hosts of that show. You'll be aware of those guys, I'm sure. They're pretty uh, popular. So you've probably seen this board before, to cover the ROMs up here, because uh, we've got serial numbers on there, I'll have to mask those out. But you'll have seen this board before on RMC's channel, because he was the guy that fitted the sockets here. Yeah, one thing I would say is that this is the odd uh, blobby <laughs> solder point on there, but I'm pretty sure if RMC comes across one of my boards at some point, it'll go, oh, look at that blobby solder that Gadget put on there. So it's one of those, really. Now this is supposed to have an IDE fault, that is all, as far as I understand, but look over here, <laughs> that caught my eye straight away, it stands out like a sore blooming thumb, the, the trace is lifted here, it's been vaporised, that is the 12 volt rail, I know that because I've just looked on the Mega PCB Explorer. The other thing is with this, it's going to need a lot of clean up work, can you just see, we've got corrosion, the solder points, look at these caps here, they're horrendous, absolutely horrendous. So uh, yeah, some work with a fiberglass pen, some vinegar, some fresh flux, you know, flux and solder. Look at these here, terrible, absolutely awful. I bent that pin away, it was short and almost on there. That could be from transit. And look at this, this is a ferrite bead. Where, where's the the outside bit? You've got the core, the centre conductor, but the actual ferrous material has uh, broken off that at some point. Looks like it's had a new port. One of those is different, so that's been changed. Things kind of look okay over here, but then we start to get some dull solder points again. One or two around there, look at those resistors, those are going to need reflowing and cleaning up. And then we've got some greenness down here, I'm freezing at the moment in here, it's actually freezing, look at that, it's black. There's corrosion in there, I'd be amazed if that RTC works. Uh, and it's a similar story up here, look at these, oh my goodness. You know, you've got to reflow these things really at the very least. You've got to clean up with a fiberglass pen and add some flux and dissolve the braid, remove the old solder, add some new solder. Again, that perhaps needs reflowing. Uh, and the ground points are just a bit dirty. You know, I wouldn't leave them like that. But in general, this board doesn't seem too bad. Uh, anyway, so yeah, my first uh, concern is what has happened. The 12 volt rail on this. I'll also be very surprised if there isn't an additional fault with this because the 12 volts is needed by the audio circuit here. And I did some brief connectivity a minute ago and I couldn't find any connectivity on the 12 volt rail, which is no wonder because it's gone. So the power connector here, these two first connections here are plus 12 and minus 12. They seem okay, they're not short to each other, that's what I'm checking. We've got two grounds uh, here, I think, these are grounds. So if we test the two grounds, yeah, dead short there, so the grounds are connected to each other. The 5 volts is this, where the red one is here. Now it's giving a beep, but let me show you, showing 0.83. I know that's normal, actually. I thought a minute ago that was a short, but it's not. That's normal on these. Um, so we'll do the same thing with the plus 12 to ground. I think that might be the minus 12 actually, and then the other one. Yeah, we've got some resistance there, and some there, higher there. But it's not short. So, hmm, let's just check these uh, diodes here. So I'm on the diode test. So you can see from anode to cathode, we've got a reading, that's correct. And the other way around, that's correct, kind of like infinite. Uh, and this one here, the band is down here, so from anode to cathode, yeah, that's all right, so that diode is okay. And the other way around, that's okay. So it's possible that something was fitted in here incorrectly, like a Zorro card the wrong way around, a fault with the bridge board, maybe the bridge board wasn't aligned and went in at an angle. That can sometimes be an issue because you've got to then question what did the 12 volts short to. I think what I'm going to do next, actually, based on that theory as a possible uh, reason, you know, reason why this may have failed, is to look at the pin out here, look whether that's uh, plus 12 volts is, and I want to see what pins are next to it because that could be part of the clue as to the, the actual fault this has been reported with, which is an IDE fault. Let's say, for instance, it connects to uh, one of these. Uh, the PLDs here, you know, these gals. Anyway, I'm going to go look at the pin out of that now.
so please excuse the rather crude masking here I just literally just ripped some uh, red tape I've had to put a few layers there just to cover the serial numbers on that because I don't want anyone, anyone uh, taking advantage of uh, Ravi's serial number there and I don't know trying to claim updates or something from the author um, you can see I'm just about to power this up I've not got a CPU card in because you know what I don't want to risk my CPU card in this board until I know the, the power rails are okay so we measured there between 5 volts and ground there was no short low resistance about 0.80 as you saw my meter my other 4000 and Stevens 4000 were exactly the same you do see a low resistance between 5 volts and ground so I measured here between 5 volts and ground 5 volts and 12 volts uh, 5 volts and minus 12 volts there are no shorts there and plus 12 12 and minus 12 to ground no shorts on any of those so I feel comfortable powering this up so I'll connect my uh, multimeter up uh, I think we'll just uh, we'll leave it plugged into these things here let's just connect it to the 5 volt connector there if I can just shove my probes in a little bit it should hold in place and then if we switch it on I'll try and point that at you uh, yeah so the 5 volt rail is ok switch it off I've also just clipped an LED on here and I used this when I was testing Stevens boards and things it just allows me a visual indication there, a reminder that it is actually on so I'm going to leave that meter connected up that way and uh, the next thing I'm going to do is switch it on, no CPU card and I want to just feel the tops of the ICs here at this stage just to make sure nothing is uh, going nuclear I mean I would see a voltage drop if there was probably or we might be able to smell something but I mean, the thing is, that rail, when that rail went, someone must have been able to smell that. You would have smelled burning electronics when that 12 volt rail burned up the way it, uh, it, it, it did in the past. You never know though, that could have been done a long time ago in the past, but the thing is, because it's on 12 volt rail, I'm guessing the audio is not going to be working on this because you're missing the 12 volts, unless it happens to have disintegrated the trace leading to the Zorro, but maybe by coincidence or miracle rather, maybe it's ended up on the uh, audio section. I think we'll measure the audio section next. I'm going to put the ground through one of the ground straps there. Right, let me just measure one of the uh, 5 volt rails here, just to make sure we've got 5 volts again. Hang on. Yeah, so we've got 5 volts, and uh, you can see the probe up here. I'm just going to measure the supply pins on the op-amp. Yeah, they've got minus 12. Let's just see if we've got plus 12. Minus 8? How have I got minus 8 on the positive rail there? That's a bit strange. So we seem to have two minus supply rails. That's a little bit weird. Minus 12 going to where plus 12 goes is not a good thing for sure. So I just quickly tested with my CPU cards doing nothing. But I then remembered this is probably going to be used with an 040 or an 060. So the clocks here, the jumpers are set to external. External, they want to be internal. Internal when you're using the 3630 here. So let's connect the 3630 back up again. And I'll just, uh, I'm just on. It's not a very good slot that actually. And we'll just clip it together. I'm not sure that's booting actually because I don't see the background screen. It's like black and black, it's not black and dark. Grey. I'm just going to measure the voltage as well we're doing this. Yeah, the 5 volt rail's alright. But that would appear to not be booting to me. This isn't an IDE fault at all, this is a major problem that's happened to this board. It's had a major trauma. If the 12 volt is short to the 5 volt rail, it could be game over for this. Because that is, that is not doing anything, is it? That is not doing anything. Oh God, the simplest of things. I've just spent the last five minutes, I kid you not, looking at this board going, oh, I'm not going to work on this, I'm going to send this back. This is catastrophic, something short to this 5 volt rail and destroyed a lot of stuff on the board or something, something major's happened. You know what, I didn't have the TV switched on. <laughs> I've been looking at the black screen for the last five minutes. I seriously was ready to go have a rant at Ravi <laughs> and send this back. Because, and you might think, wonder why, you know what. Because the thing is, this is supposed to just have an IDE fault. And seeing what we've seen with that 12 volt rail there, and then it being completely dead and not working at all with my CPU card. I even removed all this uh, RAM there, 
just left his chip ramming and when it still wasn't doing anything at all I thought no this is something major has happened to this I'm being told Porky's here you know <laughs> someone's fibbing somewhere because there's no way that trace could vaporise in transit that's for sure um, but anyway it seems to be unrelated the uh, there is obviously a problem with it though because the op amp is outputting at minus 8 volts on the 12 volts rail. Anyway, let's just power that back on again. Yeah, that's normal. That's the green line I was looking for there and then it should come up with a sticker disc in screen. So I think when that comes up, I'm going to try my compact flash adapter here. So compact flash is connected. What I like about this is I can see the LED there. Let's uh, see what happens here. Hang on. Something there is shutting something out because it seemed to go into a shutdown there straight away. The fact the LED wasn't illuminating. Let's try that again. Let's uh, have a look at this LED. It's all right again now. So I'm always a little bit alarmed when uh, basic stuff like that doesn't work. Like, what was the issue here? Why was this suddenly shutting things out? I don't know. Something around here must be short to ground we'll uh, just give that one more try I think we'll just uh, connect that up again carefully making sure its pins are aligned properly and uh, yeah we'll just give that one more try but if those LEDs go out there that is a sign there's a problem it's alright this time maybe it was a bad connection But it's clearly not booting, is it, off the uh, IDE. So I'm watching the LEDs, there's obviously nothing, but the, the power one is on, that's okay. I'm not sure what that green one indicates, I can't remember what the green one indicates. But anyway, the yellow one's not flashing, the red one is on. But it's not even coming up with a sticky disk in screen, look. Now that could just indicate the IDE buffers, actually, so it might be... As simple as it seems, let's just remove the compact flash card. I'm just testing that's not hot and it isn't. I'll switch it back on again. If that boots normally, yeah, it is doing. That would kind of suggest it's probably about the IDE buffers. It may be that simple. Now, the next course of action with this, I know we've not done anything with the 12 volt rail, but my next course of action is to get diagram in there, and there's a reason. The, the reason it was freezing then, it wasn't booting up tells me it was probably crashing and I think the reason it wasn't booting is one of the pins on those buff buffers there, the 245's probably means it's reading some spurious data now the thing with Diagram, it will query the drive, you can actually look at the drive parameters and if that doesn't come back in uh, proper you know, ASCII plain text, you know, showing that it's a CF card and it's the version number and all the rest of it, if it's corrupted that is a clue that it is those bus transceivers so there is another problem with this as well, there is no fast RAM as you can see, I've got the fast RAM back in and it's not detecting anything. So I'm taking the RAM back out, I've got the ESD rest strap on while I've been doing these things, including putting the diagram in there but the, the RAM is not detected at all so there's a RAM fault with this as well. Now it could be related to the IDE fault, that's possible. But. Uh, yeah, I mean the points look good and these sockets were new, RMC fitted these didn't they? Uh, but you've seen the corrosion, I don't know if it showed you up close, there's loads of corrosion around this area here where the RAM is, the wires are terrible around there and the RTC in particular. So uh, I don't know, we'll just try reseating this one more time just in case they weren't clipped in properly but I mean I've tried this once already. Let's just hope it was a bad connection. No, it says, uh, yeah, there's none. It would have been reported there. It would tell you what address range it sits in. You can see here, uh, zero KB fast. So, there's a RAM fault as well on this. Oh, God. What a nightmare this board is. Anyway, let's uh, switch it off. Let's try what we were going to try, which is to check the IDE. I tell you, I'm losing the will to live looking at this one. I thought this was going to be simple. I think the way it was explained to me, I think Stephen had a, a think about it and talked to me about it and he was like, ID's not working, what do you think? I was like, oh, bus transceivers. And he was like, oh, okay, 
and Ravi's asked if he can have a look at it and I'm like yeah alright then if it's bus transceivers that should be nice and easy well so far we've got 12 volt rails disintegrated we've got minus 12 volt on the 12 volt side of the op amp the IDE doesn't work and there's no fast ram uh, and there's lots of corrosion which uh, uh, it's not good is it so I'll switch it on again let's test the IRQs that's ok let's test CIAs It's always a good idea to reel some of these things out. Yep, that looks good, doesn't it? Yeah, there we go. Gary IDE test A4000. Not found. Not found. It's just not seen it at all, is it? So the next thing I'm going to do here is to connect my logic probe up to the power supply and um, we'll just uh, power this on just make sure my logic probe is working if we touch a, a, I don't know, a ground point or something somewhere there we go we've got ground so i've adjusted the camera a little bit there i just want to just carefully check these two ic's here i think we'll do this one first this is i think this is the inverter is it an 04 probably low nada I think we've worked out the fault already <laughs> with this, it really is that simple. Can you see that? We've got a low there, nothing coming in. There should be something there. We've got a low, a high, that's correct. Pulsing primarily low, pulsing primarily high, that's VCC. Start from pin one, high. Yeah, pin one, pulsing, so you can see pulsing output, that's right. Pulsing, pulsing output, that's right. Pulsing, pulsing, that's right, and then our uh, ground. So, as there are so many issues on this, I'm going back to look at the 12 volt issue actually. Um, now, the first thing I'm going to do is just remove this. Can you see this? You could try and glue it down, but look, it's just floating off there. It's disintegrated, it's disintegrated in a few places. So, I'm just going to pull it. There you go, it's come off already. Pull it off there, and it's the same here. Look. The whole thing is just lifted right to the point here. So again, I'm just going to just uh, carefully pull it there like that, and uh, we'll just bridge that with a wire. Now, for the moment, I'm going to use a very, very, very fine wire in order it acts as a fuse. If you were to put a really thick wire across here, and there is a short somewhere. It's, uh, it's going to add to problems. Um, but the other thing we will do is obviously test at various points to make sure there's no short to ground. So from this side over here, if we measure on here, let's just test to the connector there. Yeah, so we've got a joint. And we'll test to ground just to make sure that is not shorting to ground. And it isn't. There's a resistance there. Let's just put it on resistance mode actually, just so I can see how big a resistance. Yeah, it's in the region of mega ohms. We're getting like two mega ohms and dropping very slowly so we'll do the same thing over here mega ohms again 8.2 mega ohms on the meter so whatever the short was isn't there at the moment it could be the hard disk that was connected or something well mind you the hard disk wouldn't have drawn current through here something that was connected to this was drawing too much on the 12 volt rail perhaps short to ground but it's not there now so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to as I say bridge over here with a tiny piece of coil wire for the moment because if there's too much current that will burn up really quick um, and then just see what's going on with the 12 volt side I'll do some more connectivity first though just to make sure that the, this rail is going from where it should do at each end uh, and then I'll retest that way And you may wonder why, why would I cut that off and not glue it back down? And the answer is that's a 12 volt rail. Do you really want to rely on a little bit of glue holding this all the way along here? What happens if it comes loose and shifts and your 12 volts goes somewhere else on the board? It's just not a good idea. So uh, I'm going to solder from the Zorro connector here. We'll, we'll turn over that in a minute, I might even just cut that little bit off. And down here I'm just going to solder onto that little bit that's exposed. I can uh, scratch the wire off later and I've got the coil wire here, you can see it's so small I can hardly even see it. This is what I want because there's hardly anything on this drawers very much on the 12 volt rail. 
so uh, just for the moment this will do the job but ultimately you want something a little bit beefy than this because that is a thick rail if you've got Zorro cards that are drawing on that 12 volt rail that's a factor and if I could just about see what I'm doing here I can barely see that wire I'm going to just uh, solder it onto the point there if I can, I can't see it that's it and uh, join it up onto that the other thing uh, I think I will do as well is just put a little piece of captain tape over this here to hold this because if this doesn't burn up and a bit flies off the 12 volt could go somewhere else couldn't it this is the issue you need to think about these things you have to assume the worst you know if you expect the worst you'll be pleasantly surprised if it doesn't go wrong if nothing happens thicker wire is not too bad of a problem to be honest because it will go at the weakest points it'll go on these little bits of the trace that are left if there is uh, if there was still some sort of short scenario but you want to do everything you can to mitigate against further problems including using a current limited power supply where you can and since I'm using an ATX power supply as well you can understand why I'm going with this really thin wire here I don't want, don't want to add to problems let's just try and pull that across there like that that's it, that's in place so I put insulation tape under the wire and on top of it so it was totally isolated should it short and melt it's not going to flip onto anything nearby does that make sense? I can show you that in a minute because uh, I'm just a little bit paranoid about this before we test it now if I switch this on there just move everything out of the way and uh, just carefully watch the meat let me move you down a little bit yeah so hopefully you can see the meter from there and uh, I'm putting the pin on the 12 volt rail of the op amp just watch you can see we do have 12 volts and it's holding no problems at all now I've not got a CPU card in the moment so the next thing to do is fit a CPU card but that seems to have solved it so whatever happened on the 12 volt rail it seems to be related to the slot I think it's a card or something that was plugged into here that shorted out at some point in the past now of course that could have happened a long time ago in the past what I think I would like to do is watch the RMC video to see if there were any clues about that rail being shorted on his video you know was that damage already there I don't think it was I think Neil would have noticed it to be honest so we'll connect the CPU card back up I've got the probe shoved into the 5 volt connections here let's just make sure the 5 volts is ok it is pointer back at the screen power it on again so diagram is starting there I think what I might do here is connect the mouse up and just test the audio so I've still got no fast RAM which is to be expected that 12 volts is going to be totally unrelated to the fast RAM I might need to turn it down a bit actually it might be too loud that let's do waveform test oh, that's good yeah left and right let's try channel 3 and 4 oh. yeah great so it didn't kill the op amp whatever happened or op amps I should say there's two of them let's go back on menu let's do play test module yeah that's normal so I'm feeling a bit more positive already we know that the 12 volt issue isn't such a big deal it really is now a case of working out what's wrong with the RAM and the IDE and they might be related well that's interesting I'm going to need to watch the footage back there it's just detected 16 meg the only thing that I've done here is just connect up the IDE which is weird let's do drive tests again yeah it's not finding anything 50 attempts there and it doesn't find anything so let's now test that RAM so test detected fast RAM we got an error there straight away can you see here bit zero so that's good that's good I like it when you do at some point get the RAM detected because then you're able to work out if there's a particular bit that's playing up and in this case it's the first bit bit one so it's the uh, lower word and it's the lower bit and it looks like it's just st sticking on the same bit there look yeah I can't go any further than that let's power cycle it again and we'll see if we can do that again I don't know if it's going to detect any RAM or not whatever it is it is intermittent that is for sure 
So I'm just going to clean up the uh, connections down here, the little wires with the fiberglass pen and the, the legs. Can you see how green those are? They're really bad actually. So I'm just going to gently just go over this here like this. I'd like to be able to see what's going on, but also get the logic probe onto those to measure them. There's a wire there that's super corroded as well. I'll get a cotton bud in a sec. Hang on. You can tin over these if they go coppery, which is exactly what's happening at the moment. I'll wipe over these with the vinegar, I think, actually. Next. Because, as I say, I think that that is related to the first eight bits of the data bus. I could be wrong. I've just got recollections of the data bus beginning over there and the other three near um, the uh, quad flat pack that I forget the name of, the one that uh, handles buffering of RAM. Yeah, it's just make it a bit easier to say measurements because I was hardly getting anything measuring those before. So the next thing I'm going to do is start reflowing some of these things. Just look how bad those are. I might be able to move it a little bit. Can you see? They're like green and grey and oxidised. So this stuff here relates to uh, the Zorro stuff, buff, Buster and what have you. These are the other bus transceivers here, F245s, that relate to the memory. We've got a bit of dust there, but anyway, those look okay. Maybe this side here needs a reflow, actually. Bridget's kind of looking okay. This is where I cleaned up a minute ago here, but this needs a reflow. The solder points on that look crusty as anything. Yeah, you can see here how crusty these look, and it's the same with all these vias. I want to use magnification, clean these vias out here, the surface, scratch them, uh, and then remove this chip, I think. Yeah, I'm going to do that. I'll get cap Captain Tape along here, a couple of layers. Remove this chip, clean up the pads, clean up and inspect and test these vias around here. There's one down there that always causes a problem. Go to the first pin on the end there, the ground pin. Uh, even these caps, oh god, that looks like that needs redoing. It's awful. The solder points are terrible. I mean, just look at these here. Can you see that? It's like greeny grey, and same with these here. So these will reflow. These will clean up and perhaps reflow. These will reflow. Uh, we did see high impedance on a couple of these here, so I never finished looking at that. I did have a look at the diagram and thought, well, actually, it seems related to Buster, one of them, so can't see how that would be causing us our problem. So I don't think that that's the relationship to the IDE issue, actually. And even up here, look at that one there. Can you see? It looks terrible. Absolutely terrible. It's amazing this even worked at all. Just wipe over that with some uh, vinegar now. Anyway, that's looking better already, but we will reflow those. I'll do the 245 down there where we clean the pads as well. I might just try reflowing it rather than remove it initially. Wow, that's not melting at all. It's like concrete. Let's uh, just get a bit of solder on the iron. The iron is on, by the way. It's, uh, yeah, when you get no reaction like that, when you try and melt something, you know it's uh, a bad connection. Yeah, it's starting to melt there, look. Wow, that was terrible. Absolutely terrible. I think I'm just going to get my uh, other iron onto this, actually. It'll just make slightly lighter work of it. So, I've got some captain tape around there and some flux. I reflowed one side of the ones uh, near Zorro, uh, the Zorro interface, I'll show you in a sec. So, I don't envisage this being easy, let's just move the air. Uh, Extracts in here, here just because we've got all this flux here. The flux may just uh, help because these solder points are terrible, just like the ones I've just reflowed. Hopefully, these sockets won't be adversely affected. This is the sort of thing you should do before you start swapping out SIM sockets, really. Should remove that button cell really as well. There we go, it's coming off, look. Ugh, go out of the way. There we go. So I've got a rogue bit of solder there, I don't know what that is. Anyway, I'll just let that cool down a little bit and then I'll uh, clean up with a bit of desolder braid. So that's had uh, sufficient time to cool down now. I'll leave the captain tape on there just to avoid melting anything. Just carefully try and uh, mop up the solder off these pads. 
And of course it's about these wires under here, this is another reason I wanted to remove this IC, regardless of whether uh, I think it's okay or not. Come on, it's now stuck. Let's just add a little bit of flux. If you do get attached to a pad like that, you should be very, very careful and patient with it. There we go, lots of flux there. That's enough to do that whole area now. Yeah, there you go. It shouldn't really go sideways, but I think I need to here because I've got no space. Just being very gentle. That end pin's terrible. Yeah, there we go. So you can see, after tinning up there, that's not looking too bad. It's covered in a lot of flux and contamination at the moment. I think we've lost the first pad. Can you see that? Uh, that might coincide with that data bit issue if that pad was literally barely hanging on. Can't really see what's going on there. I mean, it could be it's just covered in flux. It may still be there, but I suspect not. I suspect we've lost one pad. It's easy to bridge from the wire there though, so we can fix that pretty easily. This is always going to be the risk when you get corrosion like this around here. You know, that one you saw me fix for Stephen, the pads were completely gone here on this spot. I'm going to get another cotton pump with some more IPA now because there's still lots of flux here. Look, let's just uh, try and get rid of those bits first. But it's another one of these where someone's gone, let's recap the board and leave all the crap on the board afterwards. Yay! And that's exactly what they've done. It's just like, it's a half-baked attempt to get this thing up and running. You know, you can't just replace the caps and then just leave all this corrosion. Because this is exactly why. Because you'll start getting IDE faults, you'll start getting RAM faults and various other possible faults. So a slightly wobbly close look, you can see the second pad there is missing, so that might relate to the first data bit if we're lucky. That might be the issue that that pad has detached, you know, was very loose, because this I've seen this happen before, where right up to the trace it looks okay, but it is actually detached. That first pad there was really dirty, I've just cleaned that up, I need to get some more flux on it. I need to tin that trace there, going to that wire, can you see where my nail is uh, just touching it there? Uh, and then uh, uh, touch the pad again because that pad just needs a bit more work but yeah I think we're going to be okay here and I obviously need test connectivity on all those wires there before I fit a new chip let me go see if we've got a brand new F245 so I've got a brand new F245 here we can put on I just want to just test connectivity now to make sure those wires that uh, you know, lead to the pads that are still there do connect, certainly the ones up here nearest the battery. Yeah that's a good sign, so it's just this one here we've got a missing pad for. Let's just test the one that goes to a fire underneath. Yeah that one's okay. Some of these are really hard to see what you're doing. And you really need to test these wires through to the other side of the board. So it wants to go that way actually. Right, so there we go. I carefully positioned that. I had to straighten one of the pins because when it came out of the tube the end pin was just a little bit bent, so I'll just get a little bit of uh, flux on there. I'm trying not to go crazy here because it'll just make a mess. And then I'm going to use the Antex iron again. I use the Heiko to uh, anchor it there just because the tip is so fine on the Heiko, it makes it super easy. So I anchored, uh, which going to do? That one, the left one. So I'm going to start down here on the right hand side. Always start away from where you anchored it, otherwise the minute you touch it it'll start to move. 
Anyway, let's just uh, add some crazy solder, not bother to things bridge. I'm just going to bob into them. Then I said a little bit more solder and we'll do some drag soldering. Nice and slowly. Hang on. There we go. Got a bridge there, look. Let's just remove the solder from the iron and uh, have another bob into it. There we go, you can see. Got rid of the bridge. Hang on a minute, touching the cleaning thing here. Right, so I'm just now going to just bob in and out of these just to get nice level solder. I think that's it. I think that's okay on that side. I'll obviously have to inspect with a bit of magnification here because I can't see what I'm doing through the viewfinder. I'll do the same thing on the other side. So I've still got to finish cleaning up around there. But yeah, nailed it. First time. So that was the issue with the fast RAM, I'm pretty sure. It's showing 16 meg there. I mean, we can test that anyway. If I just connect the mouse up, let's just go through the full range. Because before, it was failing, wasn't it, on uh, bit one. Let's do that. Yeah, it's working now. So obviously I need to test this longer yet. Let it go through the whole address range. But that was the problem with the fast RAM. Well, this is one reason why you can't just, you know, swap out caps and SIM sockets and stuff and just leave the board like it is. Because these things will just come back and get you. You know, it might work at the time when you test it. If you don't remove that corrosion, it will just come back and get you. Now it went round okay, and this is like the third time I've done this. I connected up the ADE again, and then it was showing 512 fast run, not 16 meg. So I disconnected the ID again, tried it again, it's back to 16 meg again. So I'm wondering actually if the ID interface is interfering there, the, you know, the, the buffers, if one of those buffers is playing up, it could be interfering with the RAM as well. I don't think that's what's actually caused the problem with the RAM. The problem with the RAM, that pad that went missing, I think that was the issue. That's probably the data bit in question. I need to look at the diagram, I'll do that in a minute, just to, well not really the diagram, but PCB Explorer to see which data bit goes through that second pin. So in summary, that means the 12 volts is back, which means the audio is okay. We seem to have fast RAM at the moment, although I'm not sure about that 512 or so when the IDE was connected. We're just lacking the IDE and then just a clean up really and test. So interestingly, we're getting some errors further on into the RAM here. And it's in the upper two uh, bytes there. I'm just watching it. I let it go through before and it was quite a lot of different bits on those upper bytes only. And it didn't seem to be continuous. If you look at, in fact it's not, if you look at the usable memory, usable memory is going up. So it's not like we've got a bad connection on a specific data bit here. It seems to be more related to the actual addresses here which would indicate RAM or some addressing fault perhaps. But the fact it went up to the first, I don't know, 5 megish before it started getting any errors makes me think we've perhaps got a bad SIM or something here, actually. What I might uh, do is just test these individually or something like that to try and work out if one of these is bad. In fact, I'm going to do that. I'm going to power it off and just test one at a time. So that came back okay for the whole 16 meg. Which leaves me with the dilemma of, was it a case of the sims were dirty, or is this an intermittent temperature related problem? I don't know, I'm a little bit concerned to be honest. Uh, anyway, I'm going to go back to looking at the IDE next I think. I need to pull the logic probe in onto the second pin, I'm just getting ready with a mouse. I'm at a weird angle doing this, same old story with me. Uh, so on the second pin there, you can see it's high, and I'm going to click test. You can see that pulsing? Yeah, it was very short. And it might not have been captured on camera, but it flickered red while it was looking for the drive. I've put the original ROMs back in, and there's a reason because it will poll for ages looking for the drive. And if I bring the probe in, just watch. Right, so this is the output enable. Interestingly, it's 
it's not probing for it now, it's just watching again. There you go, pulsing on that second pin there from the end. Right, so it's looking for the drive. Now, it could be that it's writing out to these uh, that point, but I suspect probably not, it's probably reading. And if we look at the data bits here, you'll see low, 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 this is on the compact flash side, I think, low, high, we've got a high there. The other bits are low. So it looks like that chip is faulty to me. And if we look at the, and hopefully you can see the chip here as well, low, 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 all eight bits low, yeah? And then we get to the uh, output enable there, you can see it's pulsing, it's looking for the drive. So based on the fact that uh, that bit there stuck high, makes me think it's that chip, it could be that simple. So I could be barking up the wrong tree completely here, but uh, anyway, let's just move the extractor in here. I'm uh, nowhere near anything that could melt just now. I just want to get rid of the fumes off that. So uh, we'll just yeah, gently heat this. It's lifted off the mat here with uh, some isolation underneath so that I don't melt my mat. Let's just get that up to temperature. You'd think with the time it's had, and the forks, there you go, it's coming off on one side. So these ones are HCT245s, I think. So I just realised I've only got some BCTs, but I have got one that I think is okay here. This is a HCT. Um, we'll fit it. We can, I can always just remove it again if it's not up to the job and uh, swap it out. Normally I'd like to drag solder, but I've not got the right tip. So I've anchored it and got a bit of a blob of solder there because I was using the other iron. I'm going to use the Antex again, just because it's got a really nice tip, as I refer to so many times throughout these videos. Right, that's good enough for to test. I'm going to reflow that afterwards because it just looks awful. So I reflowed these two ICs here. I'm uh, pretty sure it's going to be nothing to do with the IDE issue there. I swapped those uh, 245s. Yeah, you can see how bad those are there. So I'll just uh, gently just go over this with the fiberglass pen here. I have to be careful because the bristles I've got on there at the moment are really stiff ones and you can very easily remove a solder mask with this. The other brushes I've got aren't anywhere near as abrasive. But, I mean that's looking much better already there. I think while I'm doing this area I'm going to focus on those there. You can see how bad those look as well. It's just oxidisation vinegar that was never cleaned off. Primarily the vinegar, you know, that's made it go a little bit green. Right, I think I've worked out what's wrong with the IDE. I uh, put some uh, bus transceivers I had. These are spare used ones on here that I know are okay, but they are used. Uh, I've actually ordered some brand new ones for Ravi. It'll only take a minute to remove those and I'll put some brand new ones on. It's a good idea to have new ones on here anyway, even though that isn't actually the fault. Although one of the pins was faulty. Uh, I forget which one it was. I think it was this one here. I showed you with the Logic Pro. One of them was like stuck high all the time. So yeah, one of them was definitely faulty. Uh, I could have avoided uh, rework here by just leaving them off and wait for the new ones but I wanted to rule it out because things like this can be super time consuming and what I didn't want to do is wait a while for these to arrive because they might not be here for a few more days yet and then start looking at the problem further realizing it's not that I've already ruled them out by doing this so it's just speeded up the process somewhat the problem is this gal here I know that 100% because let me just show you something. If I uh, just connect to the ID, I'll have to move the camera so that you can actually see what I'm probing because it obviously obscures the shot here. Let's just make sure that's on properly, it is, just for good measure. Do that. So I'll talk about some of the things I did before I got to this point. But if you look at this, uh, this pin here, the first pin on this corner, can you see it's low? Right, let me just cycle the power while I hold it there. This is one of the control signals that goes to the IDE drive that relates to the read 
So there's one for right, there's one for read. Can you see it's low, it's active low. Uh, sorry, this is the right, sorry, not the read. This is the right. So that's indicating, because it's low, it's indicating we want to write to the, the drive. Not necessarily write to the disk itself, but actually write to the interface. It may be a command, you know, i.e. initialize or give me uh, set some parameters, set a property, do something, yeah? Uh, you know, you're wanting to the drive to do something. Uh, the read is the one next to it. And because that's high, and that will go low when it wants to read the drive, and it pulls there. So that's where it's attempted to boot. Watch it again. It'll go off briefly. Watch any second now. That's where it's trying to read from the drive. But because this is set low here, it's telling the interface. Actually, I'm writing. You know, so it doesn't matter the fact that that uh, read signal is going low for a, a second or two as it tries to find the drive, you know, to query it, see if there's a drive there. It, right from the offset, right from the get-go, it's telling the, in, the drive, I want to write something to the interface, yeah? I'm giving you a command, I want you to do something, before um, anything else. And I know that's, that's definitely the issue, because I thought, well, actually, I think that's it. Let me compare to my board. So I've tried my board, that doesn't happen. Now, the other thought I had in my mind is maybe it's because of the sequence of events. You can see something like that and think that's the fault, and it might not be. It may be a symptom rather than the actual cause. So what I mean is, you know, it starts doing something with the interface there. There's some handshaking going on with various signals. Something goes wrong, that pin ends up high. And that can all happen very, very quickly within a number of nanoseconds. So when you've got a logic probe on there and you switch it on, you just see hi. What you didn't see is, you know, for the nanoseconds leading up to that point where you could actually see it, it was low at some point. So, anyway, the point is I'm, I'm trying to make here is you've got to rule things out. So then the next thing I did is, I'll just show you actually, I pulled the card off and thought, let's just see what pin that goes to. Let's just see, if make sure we've not got short because it's ground. It shouldn't be, it should be high from the get-go. So uh, I was measuring from the, the pin, we just measured there, yeah, and I started here and went, Oh, it's there. No, no, it's not. That's a ground. Hang on a minute. Short to ground. And I went along here until I found it. It's actually, it's up here somewhere. It's there. That's the actual pin. But it's short to ground. <laughs> That's why it's low. So that is definitely a fault. Whether it's the entire fault, I don't know. We definitely had a faulty transceiver here. I think what's happened here, and I've seen this before, I explained when I had my... Uh, problem with my TF534. I killed it myself. I had an SD adapter, you know, an uh, SD to IDE, and I had it around the wrong way, I think, at some point. Now, 99 times out of 100, you'll get away with that. You take it off and put it on the right way, it's fine. But what you've got to realize, and I'll show you this again, if I measure from, uh, I've got one probe on ground on the board here, on one of the ground tabs. Just watch this, that's ground. And then as you go along here, that's ground. That's ground, that's ground, that's ground. That's ground. So of course, those grounds, f f five or six grounds there on that side, when you flip this around the other way, the signal's up here, bear in mind one of these is the one we need here, you shorten it to ground. So, uh, you know, uh, powered on for more than a second or two, if you left it for a few minutes thinking, oh, it's slow at boot and I'll go and get a brew, you're shorting that signal there to ground all the time. That is the wrong way around. So, of course, eventually it's going to give up the ghost. You're going to get a permanent short on there as the transistor fails and shorts to ground. So, uh, yeah, I think that's what it is. So, I've ordered some more of these gals. Uh, initially, I thought I needed... I wasn't sure which one it was before I got to this point, so I was looking at these in advance of that. This one here, I thought I needed a dash 10 in terms of its, you know, the speed. Uh, but that's only if you do the PIO2 mod. Um, I can't find any dash 10, so I've ordered dash 15s. It so happens that this one here is a dash 15 regardless, I think. So, And I've also ordered a PLCC 20 pin socket for that, or we'll socket it. So let's have a little bit of a scrub around here while I listen to Pinball Illusions. I can't get enough of that uh, intro. It's uh, amazing music. So it is a far cry from uh, the ones I looked at previously. It's nowhere near as bad, but yeah, this definitely needs to be done. Look at that. <laughs> I 
going to clean over that as well. That looks uh, a little bit greeny there. But the next thing I'm going to do is just uh, peel back this here where we had that fine wire. Now we've been using this and the audio has been fine, no issues at all, no problems, it didn't burn out, you can see it's still there. I'm going to replace it with uh, something a little bit more permanent now. So uh, I'll just kind of grab this, we'll uh, desolder it where it was soldered on up there and uh, pull it off down here as well. Do you remember at the end of a previous video I was showing you those Molex power connectors that go on the hard disks? If they flap around inside the case and touch the uh, contacts on the, that are stuck out on the back of the Zorro board here, you know, the thing that goes from down the bridge thing, you can short out a rail and that might be what happened. I'm not sure, yeah it could have done actually, because the 12 volts, if there was a short here, this is exactly what would happen, this would burn up, because you can see the power connector, it more or less goes straight here from the top side of the board to that via, so the, the short must have been on here rather than somewhere else on the board. So I'm going to go from the little bit of the coppery bit here, rather than the thing there, because this trace will burn up pretty easy, yeah, we're using a, a thicker what gauge of wire here. So I want to leave something there that's a bit thinner than this. It might even pass the same, no it won't do, there's going to be thick, thicker, more strands there, so the current wise this may provide, you know, double what that single trace would. But the point is, if you soldered straight on there with a thick wire like this and it shorts again, you may have uh, more of a problem, i.e. the uh, connector melts or something, or it fails somewhere else. So I changed my approach there, and there's a bit of reasoning. I've joined it to the connector here, so this side here can't come loose. Uh, and then down here, I have soldered it to the bit of the trace, so there's still a little bit of this trace here that could blow if we wanted to. But I'm now going to just uh, hold this fairly straight, like that there, away from everything. Uh, and then just get a little bit of hot melt glue in a few places, four or five places down here to hold this. My fear with this is this could come disconnected and short to a nearby rail. Now the thing here, the, the way I had it soldered here is right next to this rail here, which might be the ground or the minus 12, I'm not sure. So that's why I've shifted it up here. I thought if it comes detached, it's going to short really easily to these things at the side. Um, here, it's not going to come off, even if there's a ridiculous amount of current, that wire won't be a, the thing that burns up. It'll be the trace somewhere else, i.e. down here. So there we go, I might clean that up a bit further later, maybe even heat it a bit more to make it a bit flatter. But it should be okay, you know, there's quite a decent standoff from the board to the underside, so that should be fine. The main thing is, it's held away from the other trace, it's uh, got the fine bit of trace still there, so it could blow there. Just got to hope that none of his Zorro cards caused this to uh, short circuit. So we'll pull that gal off in a minute and see if the short disappears. I am waiting for some chips. The few things you're going to need to do here though, can you see we've got green pins there. Some dark looking wires here and the traces look a little bit weird around there. So I'm going to remove the solder here, clean up these things. It's only a minor thing but this like the odd large blob, can you see that on the sim slots? And there's one or two more that just need uh, just a, a little reflow. It's minor, it really is a minor thing, it's just cosmetic. But also this port here, it's stuck up a bit. I don't know if you can see this, look, watch my finger. You can press it down, it is not flat. It's pointing upwards a little bit, away from the edge of the board. So uh, I'm just gonna heat those and then just try and straighten it a little bit. The solder points on there are okay. One or two perhaps need a bit more solder. But on this point here, and I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see, one of the pins, I think it's that one there, it kind of looks like it's starting with a dry joint. So I'll reflow those as well while I'm at it. And obviously give it a clean, can you see this? Can you see the smeary marks and things? They're all over the blooming thing here, you know, it's uh, remnants of flux and stuff. But fingerprints and stuff as well, and there's just like uh, smeary bits of dirt and all that sort of stuff on it. Now there's certainly nothing wrong with the solder in here. It's really a case of, if this was my board, uh, I'll be doing that. Can you see that? That's all it needed. Uh, if this was my board, it would bug me. Every time I went underneath it and saw something sticking out like a sore thumb, uh, it would annoy me, so it's cosmetic. But the stuff with the corrosion uh, around the real-time clock area is not. There you go, so I clean that area up. You can see how much glossier that bit is to over here. Can you see all the smeary marks and things? So yeah, the board's very dirty over here. There's lots of fingerprints and grease and what have you. 
yeah, and you can see what I mean there. They don't uh, don't look so clever, do they? And uh, I'll go and test these pores in a minute after we've removed that. Uh, well, I'll remove the gal afterwards actually, because that gal may be the one that's got a relationship to the DTAC, uh, one of the DTAC signals. And if we remove it too soon, we won't be able to test anything else on here until we get the gal back on. Anyway, we'll just add a little bit of extra solder to these and just reflow them with a bit of flux here. Yeah, that's a bit better, but look at the shape of this here, what's happened to that? <sighs> Quite why it's gone that shape, I don't know. Oh, it's because they lost some of the pad, I think. That's what's happened there. <sighs> I should reflow it anyway, because it just looks a blooming mess. Yeah, look, the pad's just blooming floating there. Makes me wonder if that uh, works, actually. So with this port here, I'm just going to just uh, press it down and reflow these, just because it feels like it's been bent upwards at some point. And of course, we may need to just reflow these as we do that. So, so I'll inspect just to make sure we've not got any blobby solder there. It still looks a bit of a mess. But you can see now that it's flatter with the board. At the very least, it was off the board by a millimetre before. Yeah, that's not too bad. Bear in mind, these have been pretty well mangled in the past. I'm cleaning the wider area with a cotton bud here. I'll use a number of cotton buds and then go over it with the, the toothbrush and the main brush there but I could just focus on the specific spots this way I don't know you can see that there we've got a dirty patch here this is the thing I'm just looking for specific bits to focus on and then I'll clean it all with a load of IPA and brush but you can see the cotton bud is dirty so I can't really get you any closer than that at this point I've scratched over the uh, vias here with the uh, my sharp pointy tool I can't even see them from this distance, oh, there's a couple there and I'm just going over these gently with the fiberglass pen but the pins of this chip here, this is what I want to focus on just here, they're looking a bit greeny it's coming off actually So I've tested the RAM, I've tested the joystick and the mouse ports, those are fine but the real time clock is not doing anything as you can see, even if you set it and save, it isn't progressing. So it could be the clock chip itself, it could be the crystal, it could also be that little variable trim cap that's full of corrosion. So uh, I might just scope the crystal, I think. The other thing I'm going to do is just get a little bit of deoxid into that variable cap and just uh, tweak it one way and the other in case it's there. So I've got the deoxid in there, I'm just going to just twist it one way and the other. You can see I'm not rotating it too far, I'm not going wide, wide rift field here, hang on, it's stuck now. There you go, it is jammed, there's corrosion in there. So just twisting it a lot like that and try and leave it approximately where it was originally, it doesn't matter too much. And it's only when I wasn't filming this at the point where I did that because it was on zero and as I tweaked it, I looked up and realised as soon as I touched that it had started counting up. So that's what it was, it was affecting the crystal there. And what I mean by that is this cap here goes on one side of the crystal to ground. It's a, a variable adjustment there, just a you know for fine adjust if you like, to tweak the clock. But it makes so little difference; it's ridiculous. You could, in theory, dial it in using that so that it's absolutely precise. It might be gaining like a few seconds a day at the moment, or losing a few seconds a day. I don't think anybody's bothered about that. Seriously. We'll check back on this uh, tomorrow to see if it's held it out in time overnight. I haven't even measured the battery, the battery may need swapping. If it's, uh, if it's low, I'll swap it out for Ravi as well. I'm sure he's not going to mind paying a pound or something for a battery. So I had to bring the video to a bit of a, an abrupt end here. There will be a second part. The second part shouldn't be quite as long as the first part. Still got to get the IDE working and there were a number of other sort of small things that needed to be done to this board. Uh, and the gal came and as you see, it didn't work to start with. So yeah, a few issues to resolve yet on this board. 
I do hope you found the video interesting. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon links down below. I'll catch you in the next video.